Good worship this morning, amen? amen? For those of you who are here, anybody not here? Yeah. That's here? <laughs> You're not here? Get some coffee, would you please? <laughs> All right, he's got a load, right? <laughs> well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, I, I, ha- I have a great concern. Um, Soon we'll be transferring the reins of power over to uh, another shepherd here. And uh, I was at the uh, Harvest Festival yesterday, and I discovered that there is a side to Dr. Ashley. I don't think any of you have ever... No, no, that's... No. No, 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 no. No. That is Mickey Mouse compared to what I saw yesterday. So my grave concern is that um, he might be more fun than you were expecting, and uh, that would be good if you can stick with him. (laughs) So anyway, that was that was a that was a riot yesterday. That was really fun. So all right, so it was a good day, and uh, God gave us a rainless day, and I guess we'll catch up today on rain and through this week. But I have um, I have an assignment today. My my wife has been nagging me, and my wife is not a nag. You need to know that. You heard it here first. Uh, she's not. Uh, she's great. But she's been saying to me, you need to... Eight years. Eight years. Here I give her a compliment, and look what happens. Eight years she's been on my case about this because, frankly, we're not real good at what I'm going to talk about today. So this is kind of, and I'm taking a risk. I'm really glad, Nikki, you're here because you're one of them. I mean, you're, you're going to get what I'm saying in just a second. <laughs> I just complimented her, and you're all on my case already. Um, her and a whole bunch of others in the room are what I call the little flock. Do you know what I mean by that? Does anybody know what I mean? Jesus used that phrase. Fear not, little flock, for the Father has graciously chosen to give you the kingdom. And there are Christians who are not that interested in his kingdom. So the little flock is that crowd. I'm preaching primarily for your sake today, and I'm doing less preaching and more teaching. It's going to be rather didactic, which means boring. I thought it was going to be totally boring, and then when I preached it to myself, I went, that's not so boring, (laughs) especially preaching to myself. So little flock, I want you to take your bulletin out. If you need a pen, raise your hand, and one of our fine deacons back there, Brian, will give you one, because here's what I want you to do. What I've given you in the bulletin, both the additional insert, which you've seen before, and my notes, I want you to write down what grabs you, and I want you to keep it in your Bible or your Bible studies or whatever, because I believe it will be helpful for you in the future. See, you had to get one, Kathy. (laughs) It'll be helpful for you when you experience what we're talking about today, which I can guarantee you will experience. Because my subtitle is, After Life Together, which you know is stolen, Dealing with, what does it say? Oh, yeah, see, it's on the screen. It's not in your bulletin. I didn't want to give it away because I thought everybody who saw the bulletin would say, I'm not going there today. I don't want to hear about that. So it's a little seminar. It's going to read like a seminar, if you will. Get the notes you want. It's on, it'll be on YouTube later, so you can go back and review, or if you're, you're missing it, you, you little flock people, make sure you tell the other little flock people, watch that sermon. Now, I'm taking a risk here because I'm assuming it's going to be good. Sorry. Thank you, brother, because he was the one with the idea, you should do your greatest hits, and I said, I'm not sure I have any greatest hits, but I do have some great bullets that I use, and I'm going to share some of that today also. So here we go with the seminar, Life Together, Dealing with Conflict. I did seal the title, you know my apologies, go to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that wonderful book called Life Together, which one of you in my congregation borrowed and never gave back, and it's got all my notes in it. 
Okay. I'm not mad at anybody. I have no idea. This happens to me my whole ministry life. 45 years I've lost books, you know. They just never come back. It wasn't intentional. All right, so life together, dealing with conflict. And uh, when, when we have brothers like Gary Ingram come, or we read through Scazzaro's book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, the Dr. Phil version of Christianity, remember that? We, we long, I remember some of our leaders, I won't mention any names, Uncle Gene, but up here weeping, I want that kind of congregation. I want that kind of life-breathing body that I'm safe among, like Kathy was advertising in a small group. It should be the nature of the church to be a healing, welcoming community. Anybody who's on the journey with Jesus is in a safe zone. And we like that, and we like to talk about it, but you take some... I'm going to guard myself because my day ADD is kicking in real quick. It takes work. Anybody married? Do you plan to stay married? I'm telling your wife. Anyway, you planning to stay married? It takes work. Remember Maynard G. Krebs, you old folks? Work. Anyway. So let's, let, me, let me fly through this if we could. And you've got to have humor when you're talking about conflict because I'm afraid some of what I'm saying may dredge up some painful memories. Thank you for bringing up such a painful memory. And while you're at it, why don't you give me a paper cut and pour lemon juice on it? So, one, the challenge of community. There is a challenge, right? I want to point us true north, if I could, today on our little compasses. So my, my, my true north verse is out of Ephesians. And so we're going to put this on the screen. I, therefore, this is Paul writing, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy. This is a universal letter, by the way, the Ephesian letter. We don't even know that it was written to the church in Ephesus alone. It was to be spread because he had a huge ministry out of Ephesus went all over the then-known world. The prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In other words, why don't we act like Christians? There's a radical idea. With all, here's the point, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know what the word unity is translatable as? Harmony. Ooh, God's picking on us specifically today. Maintain the harmony. But when you're living in community, life gets interesting. Here's one of my famous ones. This is this one. I had this memorized. You remember my little poem? I've shared it at least three or four times in eight years. (sighs) <sighs> to live above, we sang about it, with saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know. Well, that's a different story. Henry Nouwen, a uh, Catholic uh, spiritual formation guy, don't hold that against him. He writes some pretty good stuff. He said, community is the place where the person you least want to live with always lives. Sometimes my family, we had five kids, and my wife used the expression, we've got a little too much together time. Everybody go to another place in the room and be quiet. And when mama said it, boy, did they, they, woo, mama's upset. That means something, you know. Me, I'm always upset. What does he know? Anyway, we got to live in this world. The person that I least want to be with always lives there. But even the best, even the most spiritual people, would you all agree that a person like the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were kind of spiritually minded? I mean, they kind of like got it. They kind of wanted to follow. Would you agree? Everybody on the same page? Okay, so let's look at this story out of the book of Acts. After some days, Paul and Barnabas, they're talking. Paul says, hey, let's go back. He had done the mission trip. Remember, they worked together and planted church. Let's go back and visit the, the saints, is what he's saying. Slipped down to, and Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. He weaned out. 
and there arose a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Oh, no, no, no. Now, some of you are going, I like that verse. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm all over that. I could think about 12 people I want to separate from. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait. Yeah, wait for it. The word for, but let me be clear, though. The word for sharp disagreement is the Greek word paroxysm, which is the same word describing a demon possession event. In other words, it was exciting. It was heated. It was a sharp disagreement, Randy. But they worked it out. They felt like, okay, I can't have him on my team, Paul said. Barnabas says, you're making a mistake. Okay, you take him your way. I'll take someone else my way, Silas. They go. Later on, Paul says, uh, by the way, send me John Mark. He's useful to me. Barnabas' encouraging gift did its work on John Mark. He learned him how to, he learned him. He <laughs> See why I'm retiring? Anyway, uh, he, he taught him how to find his courage. That's the same thing, courage. And, he, and Paul went out and did his business and started. It was great. It worked out. And let me give you a little insight. Serious servants, kingdom builders, have tensions. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't get on Twitter. They didn't get on Facebook and say, that Barnabas is a soft-hearted liberal. If everybody followed Barnabas, he'd give away the farm for crying out loud. Barnabas didn't get on and say, well, I've had it with Paul. He's such a Pharisee, you know. Unless you walk on water, unless you have the guts to get stoned and beaten and maybe killed, he doesn't want to have you on his team, you know. What a Pharisee. They didn't do that. No real Christian would ever do that. Oh, was there a little sarcasm in there? No, there were tons of sarcasms in there. Okay. Serious servants, they get into tension. Here's one of my favorites. This is a great verse for harmony, by the way. I love this account. You know, Philippians, the Philippians, were one of Paul's favorite churches. I'm making sure, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Ashley, make sure I'm not off track. Am I off track? Oh, thank you, Lord. Okay, so look at this verse. Paul writes to the Philippians, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony. That doesn't mean they have to come to this church. But to live in harmony, it's the unity thing. In the Lord, indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women, listen to this, who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, I've heard the typical preacher joke. You've probably heard it, right? Oh, you know, odious and soon touchy. Those two women in the church, odious and soon touchy. I think that's completely unfair. Okay, I do, because look at his description of these people. I have found phenomenal men and women, women especially, who have been right-hand servants building the kingdom alongside of me. Vital. Great confidence in their abilities to serve and build up the body of Christ. So these were quality people. And Paul is speaking to some elder or pastor in that church and saying, listen, you don't want the harmony of the assembly fractured. We're winning people to Jesus. They love coming into that safe, healthy community. Don't let this fester. I know there's a problem. Have them sit down and square it off. Help these women who have served Jesus with power. So, with that in mind, the fact that the church is to be this wonderful place, but we actually live in a broken world, this side of glory. Just think of how wonderful it's going to be on the other side. And you'll see how many things you got wrong. Did you hear me? Yeah. Oh, you're, you can't wait till they see what they got wrong. But we're the ones who've got it wrong sometimes. Here's, my, uh, here's a, 
a translation of that opening passage, our, our true north passage from Ephesians. Listen to this translation. I love this translation. Oh, who put that up? There? I, was, I was trying to hide the fact. This is my version, yeah. <laughs> Once in a while I do this because it's, it's kind of fun. Behave, brothers and sisters, without an attitude. You could have stopped right there, right? But an attitude of self-importance, you know. I, I'm right. I know more than you do. With love, tolerant of each other's shortcomings. Guess what? You've got them. And so do they. And by choosing not to get your hackles up too quickly, but rather exerting yourselves. That's the word. Work hard. Exert yourselves to protect the church's harmonious ethos. The Holy Spirit's tranquil shalom. We'll, we'll come to that shalom story. I mean, I've quoted that before. I want to read it one more time from uh, John Ortberg's book. Uh, that was uh, a couple of thoughts came to me, and I will read it later. But this guy, before he fell from grace a little bit, that doesn't mean the old books are bad. They're great. They're great books. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. It's one of his titles. The Life You've Always Wanted, which is about spiritual disciplines. You're not going to have the life you want unless you learn to apply spiritual discipline. Period. You know, you don't work, you don't eat. You don't get food, you know, the whole bit. This one's a great title. Everybody's normal till you get to know them. <laughs> what is normal? You get what I'm saying, right? Everybody's normal till you get to know them. So exert yourselves to protect the harmonious ethos that harmony needs to have. So steps, part two, steps to a conflict-conquering community. How to be a conflict conquering community. How to win this fight, if you will. And this is the part that's going to be like a seminar. I'm going to rattle through. Boom, boom, boom. Just a few illustrations here and there. And other things will come out in my series on, um, on spiritual gifts. I'm trying to impart to you everything I think that's in, of value, which is like just a little bit up here, but that I can leave with you before I'm done. So number one is, you see the word discounting? That doesn't mean discounting your brothers and sisters. That means discounting 90% of the things that irritate you. You heard me. That's not a scientific number. It's my number, so therefore it's right. 90% of the things that irritate you are coming out of your flesh. Have you ever read Dear Abby? I mean, boy, has she, she's lost her moral compass completely, but... What cracks me up is some of the complaints that, she, that get written into her. Dear Abby, I am so upset. My daughter-in-law put the knife and the fork on the wrong side of the plate. It was a personal insult. Seriously? You need to spend a week in Afghanistan. Get a life for crying out loud. When I hear Christians talk like that, that's what I want to say. Why don't you get a life? Why don't you look at Jesus? Uh, you may know his story. He ended up on a cross. What are you whining about? Our flesh. Tim, you had an illustration because I encouraged you with that a few years back. I hope I did. Yeah, right now, real loud, fast. Hey, wait a minute. While you're getting ready, I'd like to put the next verse on the screen. Let's do that. Some of you may recognize this. It's in the New Testament. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not be, act unbecomingly. Here's the best part. Ready? This is the main point. It does not seek its own way. It is not, some translations say, not easily provoked not easily provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now, now you can talk. Yes, Pastor has been very um, straightforward with, with pushing on me in trying to uh, overcome some, uh, I, I, would, I would definitely call them relational issues with other folks um, from my past and even present. Um, and one of the things that he's really pushed on is that 90-10 rule, 
where 90% of it let go, just like when he says, you know, when you are arguing with your spouse, nine times out of 10, you're wrong, but <laughs> one time you can dig your heels in. Um, and really what it comes down to is, is what he's pressed on me and what has been incredibly beneficial is not like thinking, like we hear that verse, you're, you know, I, I'm, I'm crucified, I, I, you know, I die daily. But it's not dying daily to the mistreatment, it's dying daily to your pride and your own personal thoughts about something. And the verse in Romans 6 keeps coming back, I've been crucified, there's no sin, but the whole thing is like, it's, I'm choosing to let sin have power over me when I let my pride get in the way, or I wanna focus on, I'm the one being mistreated, <laughs> woe is me, this isn't fair. It's not about me, it's about, Responding with humility and and really just letting it go and 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 dying to it really Are you happier because of it? 100% happier. Because I'll go of with it. 90. That'd be good <laughs> Very good. Thanks Tim. Yeah, blow it off Blow it off Listen, do you do, when you have kids and they say like my daughter Stacy I love to quote that classic conflict we had somewhere along the line where she was being disciplined and she finally dealt the death blow. I hate you and I hate dad and I hate this family and I hate God. You know, zing. And we go, oh my God. No, we went. <coughs> um, do you lose sleep over that? It's childish, right? It's childish. People are acting foolishly. Blow it off. Why are you losing sleep about it? Don't let their sin become yours. Discounting, blow it off. Forbearance, I choose to move on. Being forbearing, bearing all things, okay? Not easily provoked. That's the first thing. 90% of it is you gotta kill your flesh. And too many Christians have never chosen to do that. It's part of the normal Christian life. Number two. Forgiving. Now, let me be clear. This is forgiving without a confrontation. I don't wait to forgive. You've heard me say this before. Forgive in advance. Move ahead. It's modeled by Jesus on the cross. I don't want to take time with it right now. Let me show you this verse. I've got a verse for everything, and uh, you can look them up later more. But let all bitterness, wrath, slander, anger, clamor be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, what does that say? Forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. <sighs> I'm just going to say it and move on. This is a discipline that every true Jesus follower must have in his toolbox. Period. Period. The little flock... Make that a tool you have right at the top of your tray in that toolbox. Easy to get. I already forgave you. People come to you. You know, I'm really sorry I did it. I already forgave you. That should be the response. That's, if you're healthy, you should already be there. Whether they come or not, it's irrelevant. That's icing on the cake. You want the cake. Every disciple should have that in their toolbox. It's an automatic. Here's our problem. The la oh, it's gone. The last line. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Why do we hold grudges? Because we don't think we've done anything wrong. If you're parked there, friend, you either need to get born again. I mean that literally. You need to become a follower of Jesus. Or you need to do some real personal inventory. And I mean yesterday. I'm fine. I'm not like them. That jerk over there. Oh, yeah, I can tell by your attitude you're not like that jerk over there. Sure glad I've never said anything like that. But anyway, number, what am I up to? Thank you. <laughs> Got it in front of me. Judging. Stop. That's the answer. How easy was that? Here's what it says in the scripture. Whether you like it or not, do not judge lest you be judged. The way you dole it out, friend, is the way you're going to get it doled back to you. You get it? 
Oh, you're so exact. Well, how dare he? Well, then how dare you? All Jesus has to do is play back the video of your behavior, and you go, oh. oops. The way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it's going to be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So we've always got the answer for everybody else who's a jerk, right? So I asked Dr. Ashley in preparation for this. Um, he's he's you know got a counseling, you know, family and marriage counseling, and all. He probably has a few answers. By the way, I'm making a mess today that he gets to clean up after I leave. For hiring custodians. Yeah, yeah. That ain't, that was good. Yeah, that was pretty good. Come and see. Anyway, um, I asked him, uh, what would you say is one of the important things in dealing with conflict? This is a no-brainer, friends. Do you remember the, uh, and, and this is what he basically said, is genuinely try, put effort into understanding the other person's point of view. Duh. I think there's an old expression, walk in another man's moccasins. Remember that? Do I really think about how this other person's looking? And do I really look at myself and say, do I have a log in my face here before I go and pick on this little splinter over here? Judging, just stop doing it. Which brings us to the next point, truthing. Did you know this verse in Ephesians which says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ. That doesn't mean we become God. That would be a cult. But we become like our master who saved us. That's part of the process. When you've gotten born again, he's trying to build his character into you, the fruit of the Spirit, make you more and more like him. And how does that happen? By us speaking the truth not smoking each other, speaking the truth to one another, both speaking and seeking truth. There's the gap. I have to be willing to speak it as well as to receive it. I want to park on that for just a second. It'll probably come out more on the subject of spiritual giftings because like gifts of exhortation, that was Barnabas, or the gifts of prophecy and things like that, speak life to other people. So I have to be willing to speak it and willing to seek it. Let me just make one statement. There are some people who think it's their assignment to tell everybody what they think. You may have noticed they're annoying. It's because they're not doing what Oswald Chambers said in his utmost. When you see something wrong in a brother or sister, the first thing is not to run off. The first thing is to wait and pray and see if God even wants you to address it or does he just want you to pray for that brother or sister? Anybody else in the room fail on that a few times? I'm one. See to it that you pray. And then, not judge, just don't have to do anything. But if the Spirit prompts you and you know it, you're hearing from him to go to your brother, then go to him. And don't go to him and say, you're a jerk. Might be better to say something like, could you help me understand something? Or, and by the way, you might end up understanding why. That's a weakness. And you might be more compassionate in the way you help them if God calls you to help them. So help me understand, or I've noticed something. That was Ortberg's line in uh, the Ministry of Admonition tape that I've encouraged people to listen to. I've encouraged a lot of things that don't go very far sometimes. Help me to understand, or I've noticed something. As a brother in Christ, can we talk about this? There's a chapter in here, because it's talking about this kind of community, and the name of it is The Gift Nobody Wants. This gift nobody wants. I don't want to hear it, and I don't want to have to say it. And I'm a pastor, and I feel that. Are you with me? So I get it. But listen to Dietrich Bonhoeffer on the subject, if I may, for just a second. Who dares to force himself upon his neighbor? 
Who is entitled to accost and confront his neighbor and talk to him about ultimate matters? It would be no sign of great Christian insight were one simply to say at this point that everybody has this right, indeed an obligation. Where Christians live together, there must inevitably come a time when a crisis for someone means that the word has to be declared. And here's what he says. It is unchristian consciously to deprive another of the one decisive service I can render him. Nothing can be more compassionate than the severe rebuke that calls a brother back from the path of sin. It's a ministry of mercy, an ultimate offer of genuine fellowship when we allow nothing but God's word to stand between us, judging and succoring. Then it is not us who are judging. God alone judges, and God's judgment is helpful and healing. But take some chutzpah to do it, right? Or to receive it. By the way, another tool you should have in the top of your tool, this is, this is a sidebar is the spirit that says, wow, I sure don't see, if somebody confronts me, you know, even if it's a brand new Christian, I think is trying to jack up the pastor because he's obviously missed something. My first reaction isn't to say, who do you think you are talking to me? Those of us who think, and there's a whole section on that, I forgot about that, who think you're in the in crowd, you're superior to the rest of the other, and by the way, they're sitting here. We, do, we sit there, right? I'm okay. These other people, not so much. Who are you to tell me? You know what? I don't see that, but I, I, number one, I appreciate if you're coming to me in love to try to correct me, I'll take this before the Lord in prayer. And if you're right, I'll tell you. I might also tell you if you're wrong, but I might let that slide because I've gotten pretty good at blowing stuff off. <laughs> like I told you at the beginning, discount it, blow it off. It's really not life-changing, friends. It really, the silverware on the wrong side of the plate is irrelevant in the light of eternity. Hello? McFly, hello? Anybody home? Okay. Truth speaking. All right, enough said. Next one. Um, can, I, can I just say, reconciling and forgiveness where it has to interchange. Some of this stuff, it really is about growing up as believers. We have to get out of the Peter Pan zone. Remember the island of lost, but I won't grow up, I won't grow up. Got to get out of that. If I want to grow up, I'm going to get jacked up occasionally. Reconciling. Forgiveness, asking it or extending it. Why is it so hard for us to say, I'm sorry. Whoa, I didn't realize I did. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Would you forgive me? Why is that so hard? Anybody want to guess? We're living in our flesh, that's why. Duh. That was a little, sorry. Anyway, back on task. Hako, right here. There's your notes. Here's what the scripture says. Jesus said this. You'll recognize it. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. What did it say? Have nothing to do with it. No. Forgive him. Forgive him and move on. There's another verse like it. I'm sure there is. There's another verse like that. Anyway, it says, And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in Ah, in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. You have to hold it. I have a Q&A section. Promise? What do you mean try, try? Write it down, right? Okay. All right, all right, all right. Go ahead. If I go five minutes over, everybody's got to forgive me, honey. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That's correct. She said, Bob, if you're listening out there, she said, the question was, he always corrects me, and I'll make sure you repeat the question. Could you clarify that forgiveness is not conditional on repentance? Absolutely, you're living in bondage when you won't forgive. You never know if they're going to repent. I had to forgive my father years before we ever reconciled. I had to be free or I would have been living as an angry, hateful person more than I already am. So yes, 
There's some false teaching out there today that says, oh, no, you don't have to forgive until they... Re mm, you're hurting yourself and you're offending God. You're offending God. He commanded you. Already read it. Forgive graciously from the heart. Be tender heart. Doesn't mean, by the way, I have to be clear. I missed this little point. Doesn't mean I like everybody equally. I have to love you, but I don't necessarily have to like the way you are. Okay? But I do have to treat you with love. And sometimes in a loving congregation, it means a few of us need to stay away from each other because we're not healthy around each other. Hello? Okay. Can I get a witness? Uh... <sighs> so if your brother turns, yay! All the better. You're helping build each other up, okay? So um, nine rules of respect that's in your bulletin. Keep that with your bulletin. Uh, nine rules of respect. I've passed this around the school. I've passed it around the church. Sadly, we had one of the employees of the school walk into doc, uh, Mr. Uh, Barry's office one day, throw it on his desk and say, this is BS, and they didn't say BS. You know why they said it? Because people were not behaving like this says, and all this is is Matthew 18 put to practice. It's all it is. If you're a follower of Jesus, then do what he says. <sighs> if you have a problem with me, come to me privately. Jesus just said that. If I have a problem with you, I'll come to you privately. You know how I know I have a problem with somebody? When I keep bringing it up to somebody else than I know. Like my confidential circle, and I'm like, oh, I've mentioned that person four times. I think I need to go deal with something. Something's wrong. It's bugging me. Then I got to make sure it's not me. Because probably 80% of the time, it's me. <laughs> me. Anyway. Number six. Trusting and building confidence in the assembly. Do you remember this verse Matthew in Matthew that Jesus said? However you want people to treat you, so treat them. Duh. For this is the law and the prophets. In other words, the expectation that the community of true disciples is going to deliberately choose to love each other, not trash each other. Is that clear enough? Okay. So, not be part of the problem. Uh, that's a helpful thing. I, I've shared that before. What is gossip? Do you like being gossiped about? Do you like being trashed? Do you like that? Is it fun when people spread nonsense? And I've had plenty of it in my 45 years, believe me. Do you like it? No, neither do I. <clears throat> so don't do it. And here's the harder step, my dear brothers and sisters. When you see somebody else doing it, stop them. Oh, it's not my place. Oh, yes, it is. If I watch people selling drugs out in front of my condo every night and I'm not going to do anything about the way the neighborhood's going down the toilet, isn't something on me at that point? Isn't there a point where I could at least call the cops and be a weenie and not admit it was me? Or I could go out and say, you guys get lost and by the way, Jesus loves you and there's a better way to live than selling drugs and killing people. Thank you very much. No, it is my job. And uh, so if I hear other people doing it, it's not out of order. Stir up your courage and say, you know what? This is inappropriate. You know what? A good definition, I got it from a guy I can't recommend anymore, but it was a great definition of gossip. Gossip is sharing private information with somebody who's not part of the problem or part of the solution. They're not part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. If somebody's puking on me, and it's, ooh, ooh, ooh. now as a pastor, I get caught in the middle a lot because, right, I'm always part of the solution or I'm usually part of the problem. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. Uh, this really isn't inappropriate. You know, if this is such a big issue, well, you need to go talk to that person. It's a helpful thing you can do. If someone has a problem with me, send them to me, and I'll do the same for you. See, if I'll do the same for you, we build confidence in the congregation. I trust my brothers and sisters to watch my back. 
Listen with a genuine understanding, trying to hear. Try to get on, I think the other counsel you gave me was get on the same side of the issue to tackle it rather than fighting against each other. So anyway, by the way, here's the next one. Including. I'm not talking about inclusion. I don't know if I'm going to offend anybody. I would not vote to put the rainbow flag out because that's communicating the wrong signal. Are people who struggle with same-sex attraction or engaged in all of that, are they welcome here to engage the gospel and have their lives transformed? You know that I believe that and have put my money and my mouth behind it. And we'll continue to do that. But here's the thing. Inclusion means if Christ has accepted me, who am I to discount somebody else who Christ has accepted. Here's a famous verse. I won't read the whole thing. All of you were baptized in Christ. You've clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither, remember this, Jew nor Greek, slave, free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And one of the things I, I have said in the early church must have been a shock to people's system. A guy who is a slave in one of the Christian households is the pastor of the church. Well, that just doesn't seem right. That's because you don't have the mind of Christ. You think like a worldling. You haven't allowed that to change, the, the word of God to change. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, I've said it before, thinking has become and is worsening. It's become a lost art. Christians should be on the front end. Take the brain out of mothballs and start using it again. Think it through. What does it mean for me to have a bias against this person? In all things, you, anybody remember this little expression? Uh, it was, it's a famous quote of the guy, your, your favorite theologian, Rupertus Meldensius. Remember him? Yeah. Meldenius? Yeah. That was a little humor there because nobody's ever heard of him. A little bit. A little, very little humor. Is that what you're telling me? Anyhow. <laughs> mistakenly assigned to um, Augustine. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In all things, love toward one another. There are going to be things we don't agree about. I'm going to be candid. Most Christians don't know what the essentials are. If I put you on the spot right now, what's absolutely essential? to be an orthodox Christian that you have to be willing to die for. What's the list? I'm just going to let that hang. Because that was fun. Anyway, it's helpful to know. The church should be a safe zone. So what I'm getting at is we have biases. I've spent time with people over coffee, over whatever, and, and talk with them, and it becomes clear to me that they have not grown in their Christian experience for decades because they're still parked way in the past. And so this is not, I don't like this, and I don't, it's culture. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with essentials. In all things, charity. The church should be a safe zone. So rather than waste more time, let me just say it the way I see it. This should be a safe zone where your politics is not even mentioned. Amen. This is about Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Not your goofy conspiracy theory or any other junk. It should be a safe zone from sales pitches. I saw that when I first came here and I was appalled. I just talked to a guy I've been working on. A, a, he's got a Jewish root and he told me about a pastor who came to see them and, and here he's a little open. He's been reading stuff that I've given him and what have you. And this guy tried to sell him something. And I'm like, oh, for the love. You know, there's an old line in the Old Testament, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Can I just plead with harmony? Your future is at stake. Your future is at stake. Consider your ways. Get behind your next pastor and be lovingly outreaching, welcoming, broken, messed up people. They're exactly like you. They just look different. If you're honest, you had to start somewhere. Tim Keller made it so clear the way it's supposed to be. All of us are loved. We need to know this. We're all loved. Isn't that great? We're all wrong. 
and we're all called to recognize it and to change. That brings me to my last point. Oh, by the way, no, it didn't. I, I had this conversation. I can't remember who it was. Oh, it doesn't matter. This last week. I, let, let's talk just for one second to illustrate what I'm getting at. There are tons of African-American churches in America, right? Do You do know that the vast majority of them are Democrats, right? Well, obviously, they're not going to get in heaven, right? Thank you. But why do we talk like that? We act like that. Are you telling me that people from one of those churches and a white congregation can't live together in harmony? You bet they can. It's one of the greatest witnesses you can have. But not if you're not a safe zone. And, and I'm telling you, I am sick and tired, and I won't have to worry about it much longer, but I'm sick and tired of people never coming back to this church because of somebody's mouth flapping out there on a Sunday morning about the wrong things. You want to talk Jesus all you want, I'll back you up. So I'm, I'm just kind of saying some things as a pastor, you can tell. Last point, clarity. I had a good friend once. The sad part is, it's true, it was once. <laughs> but he had a great line. I wrote it down. It's important in your leadership, you need some courage. It's important in your leadership that people know what you will tolerate and what you won't tolerate. It's important that people know what you won't tolerate. Mrs. Monet said the other day to me, it takes a village, right, as we're raising our kids and all of that. It's my job to help keep my neighborhood safe, and that includes the environment of the church. So here's the last verse I'm going to show you, and I'm signing off. Shun foolish controversies, genealogies, strife, disputes about the law, conspiracy theories, political drama. We're taking over the, the capital, blah, blah, blah. For they are what? Unprofitable and worthless. You can have your opinions. Go talk over coffee, but get out of the house of God. Reject the factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and sinning, being self-condemned. A heretic, a schismatic. Here's the other translation, the NIV revised, the NIRV, whatever that is. But anyway, warn anyone who tries to get believers to take sides and separate into their own little groups. Warn him more than once, and after that, have nothing to do with him. By the way, I'm inviting you to leave, pal. By the way, double by the way, you don't have to invite him to leave because he's already gone down the street and started 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Baptist Church. So, I already took the question, so I don't have to do that. I'm going to close. I'm going to close. If you have questions, I have an email, and I haven't retired yet. So, I want to read this wonderful description of how community ought to be. The word on shalom, you'll remember. Um what it looks like from everybody's normal to get to know them by John Ortberg. In a world where shalom, peace, harmony, inner peace and outer peace, where it prevails, all marriages would be healthy, all children would be safe, those who have too much would give to those who have too little, Israeli and Palestinian children would play together on the West Bank, their parents would build homes for one another in offices and corporate bedrooms, executives, boardrooms, sorry, not bedrooms, corporate. Wow, that's a, an image. Well, <laughs> Sheesh. Executives would secretly scheme to help their colleagues succeed. They would compliment them behind their backs. Tabloids would be filled with accounts of courage and moral beauty. Talk shows would feature mothers and daughters who love each other deeply. Wives who give birth to their husbands' children. And men who secretly enjoy dressing as men. Disagreements would be settled with grace and civility. 
There would still be lawyers, perhaps, but they would have really useful jobs, like delivering pizza, which would be non-fat and low in cholesterol. Doors would have no locks, cards would have no alarms, schools would no longer need police presence and even hall monitors. Students and teachers and janitors would honor and value one another's work. At recess, every kid would get picked for a team. Churches would never split. People would be neither bored nor hurried. No father would ever say again, I'm too busy to a disappointed child. Our national sleep deficit would be paid off. Starbucks would still exist, but would sell only decaf. <laughs> you heard it. This car, this, divorce courts and battered women shelters would be turned into community recreation centers. Every time one human being touched another, it would be to express encouragement, affection, and delight. No one would be lonely or afraid. People of different races would join hands. They would honor and be enriched by their differences and be united in their common humanity. And in the center of the entire community would be its magnificent architect and most glorious resident, the God whose presence fills each person with unceasing splendor and ever-increasing delight. The body should be a foretaste of heaven above. Let's pray together. I'm praying for the little flock. Those who are hungry and thirsting after righteousness. That, Lord, these tools would get in there. They would get worn out. <laughs> these tools would get worn out from use in their toolbox. Build up your people. Let your shalom prevail. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless.